Hi guys, Ben here and welcome to Motivation to Invest. Bill Ackman is one of the greatest and most controversial investors of all time. He is considered by many an active contrarian who takes bold bets against the consensus. As the founder and CEO of Pershing Square Capital, he is worth an estimated $1.5 billion. Recent times, Bill Ackman has turned $27 million into $2.6 billion by predicting that the global health crisis will cause the stock market to crash. Moreover, Ackman recently sold his shares in Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway so his own investing firm could be more nimble and take advantage of a potential stock market crash again. So it seems Bill Ackman has no issue making bold bets against the consensus. But what gives him this confidence? <music> So the market also seems to gyrate more than normally. Uh, we have market going up a thousand points, down a thousand points. Is that because of computerized trading, or why is the market gyrating so much? Uh, the you know again the the market is a discounting mechanism, and uh, people's estimates of the future uh, have been very volatile. You know, how long is the crisis uh, going to go on for? Uh, when will we get back to our normal life? You know these things affect the input of the model uh, that analysts are are using to value uh, securities. I think the other issue is the market in the short term is very much a sentiment index. It's a way for people to express their emotions. And uh, there's been a lot of emotions in the short term. And when that happens, uh, there's a corresponding degree of volatility. Uh, but I, I don't think the market is dramatically wrong. You know, when you look at the market on a company by company basis, we look at the companies we own, uh, you know, different businesses have been affected differently. Some, you know, many businesses have been, will be long term beneficiaries. It's, uh, it seemed to be uh, strange to somebody who's not following them quite the way that you do. Uh, the, the, the economy seems to be in a recession, a fairly deep recession, yet the market is almost where it was uh, when we started this recession. Can you explain that, why the market seems to be so much higher than the economy is? Sure. So, you know, when people talk about the market, they talk about either the Dow or the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index. And what's interesting or fortunate and unfortunate about the crisis is it affects different companies differently. And the more dominant large cap you know, companies, the more the stronger the balance sheet, the stronger the market position, those businesses are huge beneficiaries of, of the crisis. Um, and what the, what the market does not reflect are small businesses, private companies, more levered businesses that uh, don't have access to capital, don't have the same dominance as the public market. So a business like Amazon, which is a very big component of the uh, the market, is you know is up forty five percent. That does a lot, obviously, for the averages. It's probably something approaching almost ten percent of the S and P index today. And my guess is you know six seven percentage points of the index. Businesses like Google, Facebook. Uh, I think long-term beneficiaries, and uh, ultimately, the value of a business is the present value of the cash it generates over its life. And even if the cash flows are disrupted in the short term, if they're greater in the long term, the values will be higher. So I think the stock market is a snapshot of a portion of the economy. If it were, if you had an index of smaller businesses, uh, the market would be down 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. So, uh, not long ago, you made a very uh, spectacular investment, as I remember it. It was $27 million you put on a hedge, in effect, and it became worth more or less $2.6 billion, something like that, about 100 times your money. So I don't know if you've done a lot of those 100 times your money deals, but uh, was that something that you expected that would go up that much? And uh, you were later criticized by some for having gone on CNBC and, and kind of talked down the market at the time when you had a short position. Can you explain why you made the investment and why the criticism might not have been fair? Uh, sure. So uh, what we did is we bet that credit spreads would widen, which I thought was a very, very low risk bet uh, in the sense that credit spreads were at the all time tightest levels ever going into what I thought would be a fairly serious economic crisis. If we were wrong about the economic impact of the crisis, we would have paid, again, a relatively modest amount of premium. Uh, you know, to be wrong. So it was a very asymmetric uh, bet. And, you know, unfortunately, things played out the way we expected in terms of the economic impact of the crisis. You know, if you actually watch my CNBC segment, uh, all 28 minutes of it, which I think a lot of people didn't do, uh, as opposed to the snippets that CNBC advertised after my presentation, I, I actually gave a, 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 where I said, well, look, we're at a fork in the road. 
if we go down one fork, it's doom and damnation. And that fork was a, a one in which we did not, in effect, shut down the country briefly and carefully reopen the country. It went down, a, just let the virus go roughshod. I, I felt it would have very dramatic uh, economic and health implications. That was the, the part I was most concerned about. Um, but as I said in my 28 minute presentation, that I was actually quite bullish because I was very confident that the government would, in effect, shut down the country and that would you know, stunt the growth of the virus, allow us to reopen the economy. And what I said on CNBC, that's why I'm buying stocks. And uh, I made, uh, we went bullish, you know, we were very, very bearish going into March, March uh, 12th. And on the 12th, we started buying stocks very aggressively and we started unwinding our hedge as quickly as possible. I went on CNBC on the 18th. By the 18th, I had 3.3 billion more exposure than I did on the 12th. And I was really, in a way, I was talking my book and my book was bullish. I was betting that the country would be shut down. And, and fortunately, I think for the country, uh, California initiated the shutdown uh, within 24 hours and then New York State and then the rest of the states have, have largely followed. And that's why you, you're going to have the opportunity for an economic recovery and the, the virus will kill you know, only 150,000 people instead of you know, what, what could have been millions. But the yeah, the unfortunate part is the uh, you know CNBC ran you know thirty second segments where I talked about the fork in the road where of doom and damnation, and they didn't run the segments where I was saying actually I'm bullish. So if you go back and watch, you'll come away with a very different impression than uh, some people okay. perceive based on short snippets. Well, do you have any more hundred times your money bets that you might be able to give to us, uh, where somebody might be able to make a hundred times their money in the not too distant future? Any good bets you might recommend? Sure. So the, the, it's a bit of an overstatement to say, you know, we ended up, you know, spending $27 million on the insurance policy on which we collected uh, $2.6 billion. Um, but we had to, you know, the way that bet is entered into is you commit to pay $500 million per year for five years. And the longer you keep it on, the more you can lose. So it's a little bit different than someone who can scrape together, you know, $10,000 and make a hundred times. So it was a, it's a bit of an overstatement uh, to say we made a hundred times, but it was it was a very good hedge, and uh, we were able to invest the money in the market and protect our investors' capital, so we felt good about it. Sure. So there's sort of eight principles that have driven our investment success, and when we have veered from those eight principles, uh, we've lost money. And uh, after the uh, 2000, we went through a very difficult period, circa 2015, 2016. The two investments you mentioned were big drivers of that. It was, uh, you know, if you will, experiences making mistakes and learning from them. And it was a moment of reflection for the firm. And I went back to the core principles that have driven our success for the first 12 years. And I had a member of the investment team literally engrave them in a stone tablet, not dissimilar from Moses' Ten Commandments. And I had that stone tablet put in a, what you might call a deal toy, it sits on everyone's desk in the office. And uh, we've adhered to those principles, you know, ever since. And, you know, we've been fortunate uh, to return to the success we had for the first uh, dozen years. So I think it's about keeping to, you know, our, our principles are basically, we want to invest in simple, predictable, free cash flow generative dominant companies with large barriers to entry that are in high returns on capital, that have limited exposure to extrinsic risk we can't control, strong balance sheets, don't need access to capital to survive, have excellent management and good governance. Sounds logical, um, but, you know, occasionally we've diverged and there's uh, those times, you know, there's a certain discipline that comes with investments, and there always seems to be a countervailing quality that caused us to diverge. Uh, but in really each case, we've compromised on business quality or complexity. We've been harmed uh, from an investment standpoint. So which of Bill Atman's rules resonated the most with you? Comment your favorite below. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead, smash that like button, and definitely subscribe. See you next time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ay, coming in, yeah. Flex, I just wanna win, yeah. LABB, who we running with, yeah, 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 yeah. Ay, coming in, yeah. Flex, I just wanna win, yeah.